Well, this morning, as I've already mentioned, we're going to be looking at three verses of the text that I've already read, but let me read those three verses again. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, Paul writes this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And again, let's not you know, uh, separate this from what we read earlier. What we were like before the grace of God came into our lives. You were dead. We were all dead. We used to live like the rest of the world, but God in his mercy made us alive. And that is the grace that Paul is talking about here. Now, we've seen in our series uh, how important the Bible is. Remember the principle of sola scriptura, that these 66 books of the Bible are God's very words. He has given to us His truth. He has told us how things really are, and it's a great blessing to have the Word of God. We've also seen how important it is that we listen to what it is that God actually says in this Word. Uh, we saw from the book of Proverbs, uh, as the word of God, the truth of God, the wisdom of God is represented as a woman who is speaking out in the public areas, calling to everyone who will listen. And she talks about those, you know, what will happen if you do listen to her. If we do listen, she said, things will go very well for us. We'll have a long life. We'll be happy. Um, and we know biblically that if we listen to what God says in his word regarding the gospel will have a very long life and will have a very blessed life, eternal life with the Lord in heaven. But we're also reminded in that passage what will happen if we don't listen to her. She says, I will even laugh when your calamity comes upon you, when it comes upon you like a whirlwind. You know, we don't often think of God in these terms, but we are going to see a little bit more about that today. God does not love the damned in hell. God is pouring out his wrath upon them. They wouldn't listen to him. And so now they have to face the consequences. So if we don't listen to what he tells us in his word, there are serious consequences. If we don't understand that, we don't understand the urgency that others hear the gospel. We also don't understand the value of the gospel in our own lives and how thankful we should be that the Lord has saved us from this. Now, what happened in the medieval church is a very good example of what happens when you don't listen to God. They didn't listen. They listened to their traditions, what they thought was the tradition of the early church. They listened to their councils. And though the councils got many things right, the later councils got many things wrong. They listened to their popes who contradicted one another through the centuries instead of listening to God. And by listening to these other things, what do you suppose happened to them? Well, in the end, they ended up in hell because they didn't trust in Jesus. The gospel was hidden. We need to make sure that we don't make the same mistake. I mean, we have the truth that's here, but we do need to listen to what it is that our Lord tells us if we are to be safe. So again, what is it that we need to hear specifically from the Word of God? What is it that He tells us with regard to salvation? How can we be forgiven of the wrong things that we've done? How can we escape the judgment that is coming? for these things? How can we be good enough for the Lord to accept us? Well, that's exactly what Paul's talking about in our passage this morning. He tells us it's only by the grace of God. It's only by His work, His gift, His mercy, which we can only receive through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, that's what we're going to be looking at today, this morning and this evening. This morning we're going to go through it perhaps a little bit more detail than this evening because this evening he's going to mix a biography in with it and the conviction of this young lady who was 16 years old in prison who was standing for this particular truth that we're looking at this morning, that we are not saved through the priesthood, through the sacraments, we're not saved through being united to the Pope, we are saved by trusting Jesus Christ alone, by the grace of God alone. Now, Paul tells us first in our passage that we need salvation. He says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved. Now, he was writing here to those who had already been saved, to those who were already safe, 
But we do need to ask the question, if we don't already understand it quite well, safe from what? Well, you know, if you were to ask the average evangelical Christian, they would have really, they wouldn't have a proper idea, a right concept of what it is they're actually being saved from. Because what it is we're being saved from is God. Is that how you would have answered the question? We're being saved from God. Okay, from what about God? From His wrath, from the punishment that He would have inflicted on them, this is what they were saved from, for the crimes that they had committed against Him. Now, I bring that up only to say this, that we so often hear about God's love and His mercy, and we do need to hear about that because it's true. But we also need to understand and not forget that He is a God of justice, that because He is a God of justice, He must punish and He will punish everyone who breaks His commandments. And obviously, if they don't uh, repent at any time in this life and trust in Jesus, He's going to punish them for these crimes forever. Now, think about this. Hell, as many think of it, many broad evangelicals, they think of it as a place where God is not, or where it's the only place where God isn't. He's omnipresent except in hell. It's a place that he's got out of his sight, that he's created, uh, that he didn't intend really anyone to go to except the devil and his angels, uh, and God's grieved over the fact that people are in there, but that isn't true. Hell is not a place where God is not present. God is actually present in hell. Men don't just simply fall into hell by not trusting in Jesus. It's not like they're just kind of walking through life and God's saying, turn, 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 and then they fall off the edge and... Oh, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry that happened. That's the way it's, it's represented, but it's turn, and if you don't turn, you're going to suffer forever, and when they're in hell, God is the one who is punishing them. Hell was not created only for the fallen angels. God knew there would be men in that place when he created it. Hell is a place, we don't like to think about it, but it's true, this is what the Bible teaches. Hell is a place where God pours out His anger and His wrath against those who did not repent, who did not turn from their sins for their sins, for their rebellion against Him. He is the one punishing them there. Now, this is exactly what the Ephesians were saved from. You know, by grace, you've been saved. You've been saved from God's wrath against your sins through the Lord Jesus Christ. But we do need to realize that they weren't the only ones who were in danger of this, of this condemnation. Paul writes in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes everyone. And he says in Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is death. The fact is, we also need to be saved from God's justice. So the question is, how can we be saved? Paul says, only by grace. It's the only way we can be saved, only by what God has done. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved. Now, grace is what we looked at last week. Remember, sola gratia, that we are saved by the grace of God alone. The point here is grace is the opposite of works. We cannot work our way to heaven. Work is something that demands payment. It deserves payment. When we work, we earn something. But grace is something that is free, something that we don't earn, something that we can't earn, something that somebody else has earned. Now remember, we're looking at these things contrasting what we believe with what the Roman church believes. Now the Roman church believes that we are saved by grace, but not grace alone. That we can't be reconciled to God we can't be forgiven, we can't be justified or declared righteous without the help God provides, and that help is grace. But they believe that we need to work for that grace, and we need to work with that grace. We need the priests to do what they do, put grace into the sacraments through consecrating these things and receive it from them through baptism, confirmation or chrism, the mass, penance, and last rites. So that's how we get grace. And once we get that grace, they believe we need to work with that grace, we need to cooperate with that grace, uh, basically clean up our act, 
until we are good enough to be accepted by Him. Paul tells us it's by grace. Paul tells us it can't be by grace and by works. The two are mutually exclusive. Listen to what he says in Romans 11, verse 6. But if it is by grace, if it's free, free gift, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Paul's saying it can't be free and something we earn at the same time. If it's by grace, it has to be free, and it cannot be by works. Now, this brings us to the third sola, which is sola fide. If this salvation is to be free, given to us freely, it has to be received freely without any works. It has to be received by faith alone. Again, Paul writes in Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, faith is the only way that we can be saved by grace alone. That's essentially what, what Paul is telling us here. And if that's true, then we need to make sure we understand what faith is. We need to make sure we don't look at faith as another kind of work that we do in order to be saved because, sadly, that's what some well-meaning believers actually do with it. Okay? So what exactly is faith? Well, we know, first of all, that it's more than simply believing that what the Bible says is true, okay? There's a lot of people who believe what the Bible says is true. There's a lot of people in a lot of different churches that believe what the Bible says. But James tells us, God tells us through James in His Word, the demons do this. They do that much. They believe. He says in James 2, verse 19, you believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Now, they believe, the demons believe what God says. They believe that what God says in His Word is true. They believe that God is going to punish them. And when they think about the punishment of God in the hell we were looking at and just a few moments ago, they shudder at what's going to happen. At least it makes them afraid, you see. Although a lot of people are afraid of what God says in His Word. We should be afraid. You know, we should fear the Lord. Fear is justice. That's one of the things that drives us to Jesus. And, of course, once we're in Jesus, we know we're no longer in danger of that. But if we were, that should make us afraid. It should make us afraid that anybody would go in there. But, again, the point is this. The demons believe, and they shudder, but they're not saved. There are so many people today in churches today who believe that they are going to heaven solely on the basis that they believe what the Bible says is true, and they really have nothing more than the demons. It's more than believing the Bible is true. It's also more than praying a prayer, praying the sinner's prayer. Many people today believe that anyone, anywhere, at any time can exercise faith. They can pray the prayer. They just need the right motivation. By the way, a lot of this comes from Charles Finney. He was you know, the motivational speaker. He got people to come forward, pray the prayer to save them. But that didn't save them. That's the problem. Okay? If we just get the right motivation and get them to exercise their faith, they can be saved. And some go further, and this is perhaps even more problematic, to, and they believe that, that this prayer, this, what they consider to be an act of faith, this coming forward to receive Jesus, is what God actually accepts as the one act of obedience, the one work that saves them. Remember I mentioned this earlier in, in the, the uh, service. They think that that's what Paul means when he says in Romans 4, verse 3, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What is the it that was credited to Abraham? Well, they said his act of faith. The fact that he, that he believed and by exercising that faith, that was the one thing that God looked at and said, Abraham, you're righteous because you believed. Okay? That's exactly what Paul isn't saying here. You know, Richard Baxter actually worked out a, a, a doctrine, you know, a, a teaching that, um, that taught that this was the case. His view was called neo-nomianism or essentially a new law-ism or the new law view. We can't keep the Ten Commandments. God knows we can't keep the, the Ten Commandments, but since we can't, God in His mercy changed the law to make it something we could all do. And that is simply belief. Believe the gospel. 
And through that one act, that one act of obedience, you will be saved. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is it turns faith into a work, the very thing that Paul warns us against in the previous verse in Romans chapter 6, uh, was at um, Romans chapter 4, verse 2. He writes in the previous verse, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God, because Abraham was not justified by his works. It was not based upon his faith in the sense that it was a work he did to be saved. Otherwise, he could boast. I did it. I exercised my faith. If I hadn't done it, I'd be lost, but I did it, so now I'm saved, so you know, good for me. No, that's not at all what he's saying. It was not based upon his works. Otherwise, he could boast. It was something that God did, and he did entirely. So the question here is, what is faith? What is it really if it's not all these things? Well, faith is believing what God said. We have to believe what the Bible says is true. It includes this, but it goes further. Faith is trusting Jesus, trusting the one he sent and his work to forgive us, his death on the cross, his obedience to clothe us with his righteousness, with his obedience, <clears throat> these things to make us acceptable to God. It's a turning away from any idea, from any hope that we are good enough or that we will ever be good enough. In other words, it's turning away from all of our works and everything we do and looking to Jesus and to Him alone, to His obedience and to His death. It is a trusting in Him to do what He promised He would do, which is to make us acceptable to the Father if we would only trust Him. In other words, when we answer the question, why should God let us into heaven? We are placing our whole hope upon what Jesus did to get us into heaven and nothing upon what we have done. Faith works, basically takes works out of the equation. It's a looking away from self and all of my works to Jesus and all of his works. That's what faith is, receiving Jesus and what he has done as he offers himself to us in the gospel. Now, Paul wants us to know uh, even further that this faith we're talking about here, this believing and this trusting is itself a gift of his grace. He writes in verse 8, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, as I was thinking about this, about this passage again and the debate, is this talking about the salvation and that salvation is not of yourselves? Or by grace you've been saved through faith and that faith is not of yourselves? Is it the faith or is it the salvation? Well, it's both, isn't it? It has to be both because we were dead. God had to give us the faith when he made us alive. And the salvation is certainly a gift. That's what this is all about. This is why we can't boast because Jesus has done it all to save us and we receive it by faith. Again, Paul, remember, began this chapter by reminding us we were spiritually dead, living like the rest of the world, following the God of this world, the lust of the flesh, whatever I wanted to do, whatever I desired, I did it. If I have the desire, that must be a good thing, so I'll just fulfill that desire. And I don't really think about whether it's good or bad, but God tells us where the, what the good desires are, what the bad desires are. We were living, though, like the world, following after what we wanted. And at the same time, because we were, we were the children of wrath, which means that we were those who were under God's wrath, and that's what we would have received if God had not intervened. Now, at that time, we also didn't come to Christ, didn't want Christ, because we hated God and we wanted nothing to do with Him. That's what it means, uh, being dead in your trespasses and sins. doesn't mean you can't walk and talk and brush your teeth and get clothed. I mean, we're all moving around, we're all doing things, but what it means is spiritually dead. You have no desire for Him, no love for Him. You were His enemy, He was your enemy, is what... Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5. But, again, remember what he says earlier in this particular chapter. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5. But when we were in this situation, God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. 
for by grace you have been saved. So when we were completely unable to do anything, pleasing to God or even to receive Jesus, he raised us to life. He quickened us to life. He gave us the ability to do what we could not do, to believe, to trust in his son. And he did it by giving us his Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus' conversation in Nicodemus, the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit breathes life where he wills. Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit that the Spirit might open our eyes. We were blind. The Bible says we were blind before the Spirit opened our eyes. We couldn't see. I mean, we, we could see things, but we could not see the glory of God in the face of Jesus. We could not see the beauty of of Jesus Christ. We could not see his desirability because we were blind to these things, but the Spirit opened our eyes that we might see these things so that we would want to trust him. It's been put in this way in, in the Old Testament, once you, or in the days of the Puritans. Once you get a glimpse of the beauty of Jesus, your heart immediately goes out to him. But we're blind by nature, and we can't see it. The Spirit is the one who opens our eyes, and once we do see it, we want him. He gives us this love for Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul means when he says in Galatians 5, 6, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything, but faith working through love. The kind of faith that saves us is the kind that works by love. Love is what makes it work. The love of the Holy Spirit, when he gives us a love for the things we used to hate, now we want them. Then we trust Jesus Christ, then we re receive him as he offers himself to us in the gospel. Now, Jesus tells us very plainly in, in, in the word of God that everybody who comes to him is welcome to come to him. We know that's true. John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out, but let's not forget who it is that comes to Jesus. All that the Father gives me will come to me. Only those who want to come, only those who have their hearts changed by the Spirit of God and their eyes open will come to Jesus. So the point is this. Salvation is all of grace. God is the one who graciously gave his Son to save us. The Son is the one who came and graciously did everything that was needed to save us. The Son gave us his Holy Spirit so that we would want to come to him and receive the salvation that he freely offers to it, offers to us. Now, he made it this way, apart from our works, so that we could not take any credit for this, so that God would receive all the glory. We're going to get to Sola Dea Gloria at the end of the series, but these things are all woven together. It's hard to, you really can't separate them out. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9 again, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works. Why? So that no one may boast. And remember what we already read in Romans 4, verse 2. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And the reason is because he wasn't saved by works. He was saved by grace alone. Let's not forget, we couldn't do anything about it anyway. We could not save ourselves. He had to do it. But he did it this way so that we would give him all the credit. Again, sola deo gloria. Now finally, since we're saved by grace and not by our works, and that's clearly what the Bible teaches, and this is Rome's indictment against us, you can live any way you want to, right? Because your works don't matter, you're not saved by your works, so go ahead and live any way you want to. The question comes up, does, do our works really matter? Do we really have to obey the Lord if we're saved by grace? Well, Paul tells us it, it does matter. He says in verse 10 of Ephesians 2, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. See, the problem that we had was we were rebellious against the Lord. We didn't want to obey Him. We didn't want to serve Him we didn't, because we didn't love Him. Well, redemption, the work that He does, fixes the problem. Now we do want to serve Him. Now we will do these things. It corrected the problem. So even though we're not saved by our good works, 
we were saved so that we might do good works. God redeemed us to make us like Jesus. When God gave us the Holy Spirit and he brought us into his family and made us his children, he also gave us new desires so that we might behave like his children, like his son, the Lord Jesus, that we might become brethren like him. Jesus is the firstborn among many who are like him. And we don't, we're not going to be like, you know, so many copies of Jesus physically. We're all going to have, you know, basically what you can see Jesus thinking of looking like. No. But that we're going to share his character, right? We're going to be like him in that way, morally, in our love for God and our desire to give him glory. We're going to serve him. Now, that's what Paul means when he writes in Romans 8, verses 3 through 4, a passage which is often misunderstood. For what the law could not do, think of the Ten Commandments written in stone. Weak as it was through the flesh, as long as it's written on stone, all I have is my flesh to try to keep them. I couldn't do it. God did, okay? Even though the law couldn't do it because we were weak in the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Now, don't think about this as Jesus obeyed the law so he could impute his perfect righteousness to us. That's not what he's talking about. But what he's saying is Jesus did this work so that what the law requires would be fulfilled in us so that we would actually begin to live according to the law. Okay, who do not wor walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit, this new principle within us, to give us the ability to live according to His Word. In other words, to keep the law of love. Now, this, the author to the Hebrews, as he's quoting Jeremiah 31, talking about the new covenant, this is the blessing of the new covenant. Hebrews 8, verse 10. The author writes this, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. And again, remember, Israel, everyone who trusts in the Lord. After these days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Here's that promise that was made in the Abrahamic covenant, but here it becomes a reality where God actually does become their God and they actually do become his people because he has transformed their lives by writing his commandments his law on their hearts, not literally, but giving us the desire to live according to these commandments. And that's exactly what Jesus did, okay? So he redeemed us to become like Jesus. Jesus obeyed the Lord. He redeemed us that we might obey the Lord. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. If we have trusted Jesus, the point is we will obey him. We will do what he tells us to do in his word. And by the way, does God have the right to tell us what to do? We don't like words like that. Command, you know, uh, submit. He tells me. We, we like to be free agents. Well, the true freedom is submitting to the Lord. We know that because we don't submit to the Lord. We are the slaves of sin. And he is a, a, a harsh taskmaster. But Jesus is a loving master. And if we submit to him, then we're actually free because now we're free to do what is right and what is good. So if, if we have trusted Jesus, we will obey him, as John tells us in 1 John 3, 7. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Do we believe that we are righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we have his righteousness credited to our account and God accepts us? Do we believe that? Well, if we believe that, then we have to believe this. Let no one deceive you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. How can you know that you have the righteousness of Jesus if you practice righteousness? We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, John also tells us if we haven't trusted him, we won't obey him. Verse 9, no one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So if someone practices sin, it shows that they're they they not born again of God. They, they are not righteous as Jesus is righteous because the one who is righteous practices righteousness. Now the reformers put it this way. Again, we are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith 
that is alone. Faith is always accompanied by good works. These works do not save us. They do not justify us, but rather they show us and they show other people that we are saved, okay? So this calls us to look at our lives this morning and to ask this question. Are we trusting Jesus Christ? Well, how can we know? Are we listening to his word? Are we doing what he says in his word? Or are we just disregarding it and doing what we want to do? If we listen, if we obey, then we know that we are righteous as he is righteous. We know that we are justified. We know that we are safe from what God threatens for our sins because we are safe in the Lord Jesus. On the other hand, if we're not trusting him or if we think we're trusting him, but we're really not listening to what he says that we are to do and we're not obeying him, then we're not saved. Regardless of what we think, we're not saved. If that's the case with anyone here this morning or anyone who might listen to this in the future, you do need to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But again, don't forget what we just saw in Ephesians chapter 2, our text. This faith is a gift from God. It's not something we can exercise as though we already have the ability to do it. It's not something that anybody can do. It's something that comes from above. You need to trust in Jesus, but how can you trust in Jesus? Well, if, if you don't see the beauty of Jesus, and if you don't feel the desire to receive him, then you need to ask him for that mercy. You need to ask him for that grace, for the Holy Spirit to change your heart so that you will trust in Jesus. You will receive him, and you will obey him. So if you haven't done that, then that's what you need to do. Look to Jesus for his mercy. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard as we need to hear it.